Good morning and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church in McAllisterville. I have a few announcements before we begin our worship service. We would like to thank all of those who are helping with our online worship today, making it possible for the congregation to be connected while we are not physically gathering. Many of you have been given the gift of prayer partners. At this time, perhaps more than ever before, it's important that we stay connected as a church family. So please remember to lift each other up in prayer and reach out to those who are on your mind. A prayer, a phone call, or a text can truly brighten someone's day. Attention to all of our students, preschool to fifth grade. Remember to have your materials ready for Sunday school immediately after our service today. Mrs. Yetter is presenting the lesson. We are inviting you to join us for communion this morning. Have your wine or grape juice poured and the bread broken into however many pieces you need for your household. You are reminded that although our congregation currently has no full-time minister, pastoral care is always available. Call the church office with any needs or emergencies or Pastor Graham Fowler at 717-320-2081 after hours. Also, anyone in need of financial assistance or food, you may call John Monteleone at 717-513-7871. Let us begin our worship service with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion. That all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from Deute Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 20. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words, words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the psalm responsively. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still seek of the food that they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
So today for our children's sermon, um, we're going to be talking about uh, Mark um, 1, 28 through 28, and Kirk's going to be doing a sermon about um, how Jesus isn't afraid of our messes. And I'm sure some of you out there have messy rooms at home um, or parts of your home that are messy, whether it's a a lady who has a messy purse, or a man who has a messy um, wood shop area, or uh, a a child who has a messy bedroom. I'm sure we all have experienced messes in our lives. And, um, And you probably had to clean up those messes, didn't you? I know I had to help my daughter yesterday clean up her messy bedroom, and we spent a long time doing that. But we did it together. Um... And it's more fun to clean up our messes together than having to clean up our messes by ourselves. Um, So if you think about some of the messes that you have in your house, and if you remember when we're in church together um, and you look around the sanctuary, we have services, um, we don't usually see messes. We don't see messes that need to be cleaned up in our sanctuary. And so sometimes people think that by coming to church, um, they have to have all their messes put away and hidden so that nobody can see them. Not only the messes that we see outside, but the messes that we have inside. So in this, um, in this verse that Kirk is going to be preaching about, there was a man who came into the, the church, um, into the synagogue, and he showed his messes that are inside of him to everybody. And they called it his unclean spirit. And um, that was not something that people typically did um, then um, in the synagogue or in the church. However, now we realize that the church, even though we can't see messes in our sanctuary, the church is a place where we all come to help each other clean up our messes, even though that they're inside. So we want you to come to church um, and lean on those other people in your church and to lean on um, Christ and God to help you clean up those messes that are inside. Because just like when I helped my daughter clean up her room, we had a much um, better time than if she had had to clean it up herself. When you come to church and you allow God and Jesus to help you clean up your mess, um, or even at home, if you pray to God to help you with something that you're struggling with, he's there to help you, just like um, everyone who's here in church with you is going to help you clean up your mess. Um, And just remember that to come to church, everything doesn't have to be perfect and right. Um, We want you to come to church the way you are, whether it's in your living room like we're doing right now for church or whether it's here in the sanctuary when we can be together again. You're to come as you are and to lean on Christ and God to help you clean up your messes.
So good morning, everyone. Our gospel today is read from Mark 1, 21 through 28. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him, and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So as Mark begins this passage, um, in fact, earlier in in this chapter, this is a very busy time for Jesus. Mark introduces us to the ministry of John the Baptist, who subsequently baptizes Jesus. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and Jesus ends up calling his first disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, right there on the, uh, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. So and we hear in, this, in, the, in the previous text that Jesus comes to Capernaum and he makes its home there. And he arrives and, and on the Sabbath day, the, 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 the passage says he immediately goes to the synagogue and teaches. And we know that this is something that Jesus does quite often. He's been teaching um, in the synagogues since he was a child. And, and here Mark um, emphasizes the fact that, that when he starts to teach, the, uh, the people there in the synagogue were amazed. In fact, they used the word astonished. And they noticed that his teaching was different from that of the scribes. He spoke with authority. The scribes also had authority because they were, uh, they were the leaders in the synagogue. They were, um, they were the leaders. They, they held a higher station. The best seats in the synagogue were saved for the scribes, um, and the people showed them a lot of deference. They were, um, they were the, the people that they looked up to. They had a reputation, and because of this reputation, the, they enjoyed kind of a comfortable lifestyle. So Jesus comes in and he starts to preach uh, with a personal authority. And we see that because of his station. He is the son of God. And the Greek word exousia is something that he used to describe his authority here. And, And translated, it means it is free or it is permitted. So we see that um, Jesus' authority allows him to teach without hindrance. It allows him, he is free to teach as he wishes because of this authority coming straight from God. In John 14, 9, Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And it's this, this authority directly from God that changes his voice as he teaches. You know, we also know that, um, you know, William Shakespeare was an author of many, many poems. And uh, since William Shakespeare lived so long ago, we don't have the, the um, we, we don't have the ability to talk to him about what his intent was for his poems. We can sit around and we can discuss and we can explain and we can, 
you know, make up our own minds as to what his intent was, but for uh, you know, the best place to find out what an intent was, at least for a poem and for scripture, is to go right to the author. Much like God is the author of, of the teachings of Jesus. It is, it's best to go directly to him. Now Jesus, being his son, has that authority. Jesus also gets his authority from his baptism. The day that John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that with his baptism, Jesus is now complete. He's the son of God by his virgin birth, and now he is filled with the Holy Spirit. So that makes the three of them one. So Jesus teaching in the synagogue is much like God being right there with us. Um, in our presence, we know God is with us, though we can't see him. But here, as Jesus teaches here in the synagogue, God is with us, with them, right there in their presence. And I can, and I can only, only imagine that that's what changed Jesus' voice. God's presence there with all of them. We also hear that he taught differently than the scribes. Again, this is much like people sitting around discussing William Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's poetry. They discuss and they read and they, they make up their own minds and they teach. Yet, God's presence is not there. It surrounds them, but Jesus has that, that extra little bit of authority extra lot of bit of authority that comes from God. It describes in, in, in some of the previous texts and some other, other texts in the Bible that the scribes were conservative. And they kind of taught a strict adherence to the law and the rules of, of their religion. Jesus comes in and he starts teaching a different, different message. Jesus surrounded himself with tax collectors, prostitutes, the poor, the wretched, and the sick. And the, the scribes of the time felt that Jesus was being sacrilegious. I believe they also felt that he was disrupting their comfortable lives, this lives of difference that, uh, that the people in the synagogue allowed them, um, the favored status. Um, Jesus was a disruptor of his day. And instead of embracing Jesus' teaching, they, clang, they clung to their, their traditions and their adherence to the law, where Jesus spoke of, of compassion and peace as well as yeah. as well as uh, kindness and healing the scribes clung to the law so there's a different voice between the two just as i've said that Jesus surrounded him with those people of unclean spirit. We see that as soon as he starts to preach, there's a man that calls out to him. And we see that so it's kind of unusual that someone with an unclean spirit would come to the synagogue. Uh, in that day, you had to have your house in order to be, to be able to come into the synagogue. But yet here is this man. He has an unclean spirit or, or he may have been possessed by a demon. He calls out to Christ. And he says, what are you going to do with us, Jesus? Have you come to destroy us? And they name him. They call him 
the Holy One of God. So somehow, um, you know, even unclean spirits have heard of Christ. They know him. Um, they're very well informed. And then we see, again, Jesus breaking traditions of the synagogue. You know, we're on the Sabbath day. And I can only think that, that uh, Jesus didn't have to, to speak in a loud voice and declare. I think he said in his regular voice, just as he was standing there teaching, he says to the, the unclean spirit, be silent and come out of him. And he spoke these words of power quietly. And still, even with a little bit of struggle, that unclean spirit, that demon that, that possessed that man, came out. It was that authority that he has directly from God and from being filled by the Holy Spirit that caused that unclean spirit. And he healed the man. Again, this is also an affront to the scribes and their teachings. We know that, um, and eventually, the scribes play a big role in his being crucified. But it was this disruption that Christ came into the synagogue with that, that, turned them, that made them his opponents. The scribes, in their conservativeness and their clinging to the traditions, they made the synagogue what we would say an exclusive club today, or a country club. You couldn't bring your mess, your wretched, your poor, your diseased, your unclean into the synagogue. That's not the teaching what Christ, throughout his entire life, taught us. We are to embrace those that are sick. We are to embrace those that are not at peace. We are to embrace those that are possessed. We are to embrace those that are sick. Churches should be hospitals, not country clubs. We are taught to be servants and not to judge. So as I, I conclude my, my time with you guys today, we know that throughout his life, Jesus uses his voice as a voice of peace, of kindness, compassion, and love, not of strict adherence to the law and to judgment. Jesus' authority is a personal one. It comes directly from God, comes directly from him being filled with the Spirit of the, the Holy Spirit. We need to study, we need to understand what Christ was, telling to, was trying to tell his disciples and that we need to understand the impact that, that Jesus had on his disciples so that we may reflect that light that I've talked about in my last two sermons that light of the world, God's light, we need to be able to understand and reflect that with the authority that was given to us by our baptism. We, just as Jesus was, are filled with the Holy Spirit by our baptism. And that gives us the authority to teach and to reflect that light to others and to fill them with the Holy Spirit, the teachings of God. We need to reflect the voice of kindness and peace and compassion and love, just as Jesus has. And that concludes my sermon for today.
guided by Christ, may known, known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For all God's work in creation, plants, animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those who protect our natural resources, let us pray. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For government and leaders, cities and nations, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of society, let us pray. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all those who need your love and care, especially Joy, Red and Lorraine, Raymond, Beth, Austin, Jason, Donna, Denny, Sue, Kim, and Bentley, and all others we now name. For doctors and nurses, caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, let us pray. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, let us pray. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Every fifth Sunday, we offer a time for anointing for the healing power and presence of Jesus Christ, the healer of all brokenness. I invite you to pray with me as we pray for those who are in need of healing in mind, body, or spirit. And I would invite you, if they are with you, that you just reach across and touch them while we pray together. Let us pray. Gracious God, who is ever merciful and ever ready to hear our prayers, we ask for your healing presence for all who are suffering, broken, and grieving. Drive away the sickness of body, mind, and spirit. Bring hope where there is despair and strength in our weakness. Turn our sorrow into joy and our pain into dancing. Anoint those who we name in our hearts now with your Holy Spirit in the healing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, here is bread, here is wine, here is Jesus. Come and be fed. I invite you to raise your bread and cup. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the body of Christ. 
the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God the creator, strengthen you. Jesus the beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you, even though you're not here. But we're going to try something here for the next couple weeks. Um, hopefully, um, you've gotten or received an envelope in the mail this week. And this has materials in it for the next four weeks. Let me take my mask off since I'm here by myself. So um, this has materials in it for the next four weeks. Um, if you're watching, and you're not a member or you just didn't receive these for some reason, we hope we didn't miss anybody. But if you did not receive an envelope that has materials in, please contact the office, ask Betty Lou, um, and we can get one sent to you for next week. Um, we're going to just do a little informal lesson here. Um, I obviously can't sit down with you and have you color, but I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a lesson and then maybe mom, dad, grandma, um, can work with you and continue with you um, it, it, with the lesson. So um, I want to ask you, um, raise your hand if you've ever felt afraid or worried or anxious. I want you to just think about that a little bit. And what did you do when you felt that way? So a time when you were anxious or afraid or worried. Okay, and I want you to think about what you did when you felt that way. 
I think a lot of us would probably maybe say we would say a prayer. I know I said lots of prayers this week. I had a new grandson be born, and I said a lot of prayers on Wednesday because I had a lot of those feelings. I was worried. I was anxious. Um, I was a little afraid. I was excited. And so I said a lot of prayers on Wednesday. So hopefully when you get afraid and nervous and scared, you do the same. Well, taking a deep breath in and out can also help us feel calm. And in our story today, we're going to um, hear about the disciples, and they're on a boat, okay? And when a big, scary storm comes, and they're afraid, and they call out to Jesus. And when we feel afraid, we can do the same thing to help us feel calm, too. And I know it helps me whenever I have a storm in my life. I just, I just pray, and I talk to Jesus no matter where I'm at. Okay, um, I want you, if you don't have it, okay, I want you to take out the, the leaflet that I had given, I had written a letter into your envelopes. The first story we're going to do today is Jesus Calms the Storm. Okay, so if you have this, and I, I only, we only sent one packet per household, so um, you and brother and sister, or maybe you and sister and brothers, whatever, you can look at this and share this. And if you don't have it right there, maybe you didn't receive one of these in the mail this week, just follow along. I'm going to try and hold it up here. Um, if you take a look at the, at the picture here, you'll see pictures of things that can help us feel calm when we're afraid. Okay, so for instance, getting a hug from a parent, or right here, saying a prayer. Or just having a friend, holding hands with a friend and walking somewhere. Maybe you have a favorite stuffed animal or favorite pillow, and you can hold on to that. Um, there's lots of things on, these, on this front picture, and I want you to put a star, or maybe if you don't know how to make a star yet, I know I teach third grade, and, and um, some kids don't quite know how to make stars yet. So maybe you can just color in the circle of any, and you don't have to do this now, I'm just sort of explaining to you. Maybe when you get a chance here, maybe you're doing it this afternoon or this evening because that's when you're watching church service. Just color in this circle or put a star. And then I want you to draw a picture of anything in you, that you do. Maybe what you do to feel calm isn't here. Maybe you do journaling or maybe you listen to music or you go to your bedroom and you just cry. It's okay just to cry sometimes when you're scared too. So I want you sometime today to draw a picture in this box and show us something that makes you calm whenever you're scared. Okay, um, we're going to have a, a video here, hopefully. Uh, Derek and Hannah are back there, and they are super, super awesome, and they've worked with me this morning. And we're going to try to show you a video. And in this video, Captain Jackson, Sailors Otto and Clara are in their tree house, and it's their pretend boat. I was actually going to be a, bring a pretend boat here today and bring a kayak, but I just decided with the snow, and I didn't think it would fit in my car. So anyway, pretend, pretend they're, they're pretending they're in a boat, and they're having a great time until a thunderstorm blows in. And I want you to watch what they do in the middle of the storm. So if Derek is good to go, I'm ready for the video, Derek. she handling, Mr. Jax? She's a good ship, Captain Otto. Steady she goes. Well, shiver me timbers. Let's hoist the Jolly Roger. Um, what are you guys talking about? It's pirate talk, Clara. And uh, what are you pretending to be again? I'm a Victorian naturalist, documenting new animals. Excellent! We'll discover new animals and new lands. And we'll be heroes back home. We'll be... Well, 
stormy. Looks like a storm is brewing. We best button down the hatches! Uh, should we stop playing now? Nah, it's just a bunch of clouds. I don't know, Otto. It's getting pretty dark. It's just a bunch of clouds. We'll be fine. Oh, no! It's raining! Should we be up in a tree during a storm? Don't worry. The treehouse can handle a little rain. Besides, if we try to go in now, we'll get soaked. Is that hail? Oh, no! What do we do? I don't know. Do we brave the storm or do we wait here? It's impossible to know. Who decided I was captain? I can't be the captain. I don't know what I'm doing. You gotta be the captain now, Jax. I'm in over my head. I'm just a landlubber. You have to save us. Stop shaking me. It's not helping. It's helping me a little. The wind is tearing the treehouse apart. What do we do, Captain Jax? I, I don't know. I, I'm still training on the job. We gotta get out of here and get back to the house. But, but there's so much wind and hail. If only Jesus were here to rebuke the winds. That's it? Well, uh, we can't rebuke the winds ourselves. No, Jesus was calm in the storm. We just need to calm down and be like him and the answer will come. Everyone, take a deep breath. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Um, I think we're thinking what you're thinking. All right, ye swaps. Let's secure the Jolly Roger and make a break for me house before the wind scuttles us man o' war. We all make up shark bait. What? Let's get out of here! Yep. Ah! Oh, now what do we do? How about we just keep being calm? I'm on board with that. What we have here is little Jimmy, who's about to take on his most wildest adventure yet. And what is that? Become one with the sea as you sail the waves with pirates. But isn't that dangerous? <gasps> well, of course it is. <laughs> But we are here to guide you through your skull flag waving adventures. But first, let's begin your lesson with sea shanties. Oh, that's how you say helmsman and pirate talk. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the video of Jax and Otto and Clara. And I want you to just think, if we were, of course, back in Sunday school, we would talk about this a little bit. But do you ever play a game of pretend... Maybe you've pretended to be an explorer. Well, where would you like to go on a ship? Just think about that. Well, the storm came. They were pretending that they were in a ship, and the storm came. And Otto, at first, he was like, we're going to be fine. We're good. And then the thunder came, and then the storms, and the wind came, and the hail came. And he decided, I don't want to be in charge. I don't want to do this anymore because he was in over his head. And Clara came through and said, listen, let's just take a deep breath. Let's do what Jesus would do. Jesus is calm in our storm. Think about it. Who calms you when you're frightened? Maybe you get frightened of the dark sometimes at night. That's okay. Maybe you're frightened of heights, like me. Or maybe you're afraid of spiders or snakes or some other animal or creature out there. That's okay. Who calms you when you get frightened? Maybe it's a mom or a dad or grandma or grandpa, or maybe you pray to Jesus like they were thinking of Jesus in their storm. Okay, we're going to hear from the Bible now. Um, and if you have a, a Bible near you and you want to follow along, or if you have your Sparks Bible and it has the storm story, if you just want to listen, I'm going to give you a little background what's happening on the pages I'm going to read to you. Often when Jesus and his disciples traveled, they went on foot. They were walking to their destination. Well, in today's story, they're traveling by boat. Maybe some of you have ever have been in a boat. Boats are totally different than being in a car or a truck. Sailing across the Sea of Galilee. 
when they're partway across, a storm comes up and threatens to sink the boat. Okay, so if you've ever been on a boat, you know that can be pretty terrifying. It's terrifying to be in your car, and we don't even know what it was like in Jesus' time if you would be walking and a storm would come, but to be in a boat is super scary when a storm comes because you feel like you're out there in the middle of nowhere. Sounds pretty scary. So let's read and see who stays calm in the storm and who doesn't. Okay, so I'm reading um, from Mark 4, 35 to 41. Jesus stills a storm. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep, on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, said to one another Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So the disciples were like, Oh my word, like even the wind and the sea obey Jesus. So if you've ever ridden in a boat, and it's been, I mean, usually you don't pick an ugly day to go out in a boat or a kayak or out into the water. But if you ever are out there and a storm comes, you know it can be very scary and you just are trying to figure out what to do. And that's what these disciples were trying to do. They were trying to get Jesus awake and they were, how can you sleep? Get up. Don't you see? We're going to die here. We're going to go fall into the water. And he's like, be still, calm, have you no faith? Okay, so... Um, what I want you to do is look at your leaflet again, if you have it, okay? And if you don't, I'm holding it up here and maybe you can see and I can read with you. And there's a part right here and you can practice this later today. So the storm in our story brought big waves and the disciples were afraid, but Jesus calmed that storm. So I want this part here in the leaflet just tells us to read this part and we're supposed to read it while taking a big breath in between each word. So I want to show you how to do that and then maybe you can do that a little later today. So the saying is, Jesus bring me peace and calm even in the storm. You will protect me. But they want you to say it taking a deep breath in between each word. So this is what it'll sound like. It'll say, Jesus bring me and I'm not going to do the whole thing I think you get the idea so just getting you to practice taking a deep breath whenever you have a storm in your life and this will helpfully calm you down okay I'm going to explain another part of our um, paper here and you again you can do this with mom and dad or yourself or grandma whoever is with you but we have two parts to our um, paper here. We have a part up here where there's tons of waves. It's a little crazy and the lines and stuff everywhere. And then down below the blue line, we have just some small curvy lines. Well, up here, this is obviously representing stormy water. And when they think of stormy water, you think of loud crashing waves and they're all over the place and they can't be calmed down. So sometime today, or if you want to work on it right now, Maybe take um, some markers, or if you have, what they actually suggest is cutting up little blue pieces of paper and gluing them all over here because waves and loud crashing waves would be really sort of crazy like. So maybe glue in blue paper all over here to make it show loud and crashing and, and, and scary. And then down here, maybe you can just take a blue marker or a crayon and color this part in nice and calm and, and not torn up paper, not wavy, and maybe you can color that. Or if you maybe have some ideas, maybe you can do what you would like to do. 
okay? So, as a reminder, I just wanna remind you of our story, and there's some other activities on the back here. And also, in your yellow envelopes that you received, um, every week there's some extra worksheets, and these would have been things we would pass out to you actually during church, because they go along. And there's a coloring page for each person in your household, or there should have been if I did them correctly. So there's a coloring page with, least, um, with Jesus uh, Calms the Storm. And then there are worksheets, and hopefully I did it correctly. And um, there's some that are more for preschool, kindergarten, first graders that aren't able to read yet that maybe mom and dad can help you with. And then for you readers that are second, third, fourth, fifth graders, there's there's a little bit maybe more difficult one that involves reading. So you can also do them. You can do them throughout the week if you want to. So just to conclude, Jesus calmed our storm, and Jesus can calm your storm in every single moment of your life. So please just remember that. Um, again, I just want to also remind you before we go here, if you're not receiving these materials, okay, please get in touch with Betty Lou at the office. If you know of somebody who wants one, we can get these sent out to them. Um, and I just would like to have do one more thing with you guys. I would like to um, have a little prayer here before we go. Again, I don't think I even said this in my welcome. I'm sorry. I think probably most of you, if you're watching, I'm Chris Getter. Um, I'm one of the Sunday school teachers here. Um, we'll probably be having a couple of the other Sunday school teachers do this maybe in the next couple weeks. Um, so if uh, except for you, Cole, I'm gall to you, but to everybody else, I'm Chris. In school, I have to be Mrs. Yetter, but here at church, I'm Chris. Um, so if you'll just bow your heads and repeat after me, we're going to say a little prayer, and then we're going to hope to do this every Sunday, guys, right after the live church service. We'll do a different Sunday school lesson, and then throughout the week or today, whenever, you can work on your um, lessons that go with this. And for now, this is uh, just what we're going to do because we... We just can't be together quite yet at this time. So please bow your heads, fold your hands, and repeat after me. Dear God, when we encounter storms in our lives and feel afraid, help us to find calm and peace in you. Amen. Thanks for joining me, boys and girls. Hope to see you next Sunday. Have a good day. Have fun playing in the snow if you get a chance. Bye-bye.